NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government. There's people out there that need help. You know, nobody wakes up and says they're going to be an addict. Nobody wakes up and says they're going to lose their life over an overdose. The COVID-19 crisis is making things worse for many who suffer with substance use disorders. But there are a lot of people who are stepping up with the solutions. This is NC Impact. I'm Anita Brown Graham. Welcome to NC Impact. COVID-19 is affecting our lives, our jobs, our schools. The crisis is leading us to revisit some important statewide topics that, quite frankly, require new solutions. This week, we're looking at substance use disorders. Joining us are Dr. Blake Fagan of the Mountain Area Health Education Center, Keith Arden, with the substance treatment program TROSA and Dr. Dana Rice with the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health. We begin by looking at a mother's struggle after losing her son to a drug overdose. Unfortunately, there may be an increase of these tragic stories during COVID-19. This story highlights the need for a broad and inclusive community perspective on substance misuse. David Hurst reports. You can just feel the love when you look at these pictures. Three years ago, Debbie Dalton received a phone call that changed her life. My phone rang and it said Hunter. So I grabbed the phone and said, I was just thinking about you and I heard this is Blake on the other end. And I knew immediately it was bad news. Her son Hunter was 23 at the time and had recently graduated from UNC Charlotte. He was living in Raleigh, and his roommate told Hunter's mom that Hunter had been rushed to the hospital because of a drug overdose. I just remember making a sound that didn't even sound human, and my husband had to take the phone. You know, we're trying to figure out what's happened and um, rushing to Raleigh to get to our son, just get to my boy, and, and the whole way there just overdosed on what? You know, that just wasn't Hunter's M.O. Toxicology reports later revealed Hunter overdosed on cocaine laced with fentanyl, a dangerous synthetic opioid that is lethal even in tiny doses. I held my son's hand for seven days in that hospital and he never regained consciousness. And I held his hand as he took his last breath. And just shock and heartbroken. He played um, soccer. The Cornelius mother says she not only lost her only child, but also lost her best friend. He, he definitely had a gift. He was very loved and he loved back in return. And he was full of energy, loved to travel, loved adventure. He was my, he was my partner in crime and adventure. You know, we just, um, he, he lived every second. I can honestly say that. Let's start with Dr. Blake Fagan. Blake, let, let's try to set the stage here. We know addiction isn't taking a break during the coronavirus pandemic, but are we seeing new trends? Are you hearing that there are more or fewer new cases? That's a good question. Um, this is just anecdotal. I don't have uh, any data as this has just been going on now for about uh, two and a half months. But um, one trend that, that we're seeing is that uh, some patients who were stable and in their maintenance phase of their opiate use disorder are now uh, destabilizing. Is that everyone? No. Is it, is it, uh, was that happening to folks before? Yes. But we feel like there's a trend that they're destabilizing a little bit more. They had systems built in their life to help them in their, in their maintenance phase. They went to work. They had their uh, a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. They had their church groups. And some of that, because of, uh, of the COVID-19, they've, they've lost their job. Maybe their Narcotics Anonymous hasn't figured out how to do it by telehealth. And so that stopped. And we've had some of our patients that have 
called us and said, I'm thinking about um, returning to youth and others who have returned to youth. So we're seeing that as a, a trend. Another one that we can't get a handle on, again, it's very hard to, to get the data this quickly and it's hard to get to teens or minorities, but one of the number one ways that people get started into their use disorder is usually at parties or gatherings with friends. And we think that because that that's not happening, that maybe new teens or young people are, are not experimenting as much. Those that already have a use disorder, we think are still um, continuing. But those are some, some anecdotal trends that we think may be happening. Oh, sort of a mixed bag, some good news, bad news there. Um, Keith, let me go to you for a second. Um, we're starting to get some audience questions in, and Kristen and Brevard wants to know, what do you anticipate the long-term effects of the pandemic will be on substance use and mental health in our communities? What are you seeing in your work at TROSA? Well, I mean, we know that um, you know, substance use disorder is a disease of isolation, and, and this increased levels of stress and anxiety uh, and depression that are associated with what a lot of people are going through right now uh, just sort of put as a dangerous combination uh, that could certainly lead to people both outside a, a treatment setting and inside a treatment setting just feeling um, a lot of, um, of things that can, can lead them to, to be, become unstable, uh, as was previously said. Um, you know, the thing we're concerned about, uh, you know, there's obviously there's some really big immediate health needs and uh and it's absolutely something that needs to be addressed but uh you know we want to make sure that the larger some ongoing societal health issues like some use disorder and mental health aren't uh you know aren't sort of looked past during all these times and we want to make sure that it's not an either or proposition but that we can continue to focus on these things and give them the attention they need moving forward, even with uh, a lot of resources going towards, rightfully, uh, the current pandemic. And of course, as you and Blake have just pointed out, these things can be interrelated. It can be the pandemic that, in fact, is destabilizing people. Absolutely. Dana, last week we talked on our town hall a lot about telehealth and its use. Do you think it's more difficult to get clients to use virtual services at this time? You know, I think that's a good question because I think it depends. Um, part of it depends on if the person was already seeing someone um, regularly. And so if the chain, you know, if, if you start to see someone just by different mode, going from person to person, now you're using maybe your phone or using telehealth, it may be less of a, um, an awkward transition. Um, I think we also have to keep in mind that different communities have different access to telehealth and telemedicine services or internet services, computer services. And so as much as we can do to sort of bridge the digital divide with community, I think that that also sort of can help to ease the transition from sort of person to person contact to telehealth. But I think that this is a great opportunity for us to expand and even normalize um, receiving care through telemedicine and telehealth. So I think there are great opportunities, but we have to be really wary of missing people, missing communities through this new virtual um, interaction that we have. Thank you all for that. For some, isolation and loneliness only add to the despair and increase the need for addiction-related services. There are organizations available for support before COVID-19, David Hurst traveled to Cabarrus County to get a first-hand look at some of these programs. In the summer of 2017, Cabarrus County EMS started seeing an increase of opioid-related overdoses. These types of calls are things we've dealt with on a regular basis. However, the volume was, was the, the problem, and we were beginning to see the impact uh, in the community uh, amongst families and and just regular citizens as well. The summer climaxed with 81 overdoses in August of that year, the highest number in the state. At the end of 2017, Cabarrus County EMS had responded to over 550 opioid overdose calls compared to 163 in 2016. And so I think that we were all very surprised to find out that this was occurring in parking lots in our local shopping centers and uh, even 
parking spaces in a downtown setting. Um, and, and I think that's when we really became aware of how prevalent the problem was. Cabarrus County has since been able to reduce their overdose rate. County leaders say they've been able to do this through raising awareness about the issue, as well as implementing countywide programs intended to reduce overdoses. County leaders hosted several community conversations where discussions centered around local trends and data, dangers of opioid misuse, and information about prevention strategies. Cabarrus County EMS, along with Concord Police and Fire, carry naloxone, a medication designed to reverse the effects of an opioid overdose. And this cabinet has a variety of resources. Cabarrus Health Alliance also began a syringe exchange program. The No Questions Asked initiative allows people to turn in used or dirty needles in exchange for unused clean needles. The program has led to a lower hepatitis C and HIV rate across the county. We understand that not everyone is ready for treatment, not everyone is ready to be in recovery, but what we can do until they are ready to make that decision is make sure that they have the resources that they need to be safer and healthier. So Dana, let me stick with this idea about the importance of community partners. In many of these programs, the partners are really peer support groups. So Philip in Asheville wants to know, how, you, how do you engage peer support group specialists and handle group therapy at a time like this? Um, creativity. I mean, I think it's, first it's critical to understand that, you know, the community partners are really um, sort of the boots on the ground that help treatment programs and other public health programs really do, do the work and reach the community in really culturally sensitive um, and responsible ways. And so, you know, the community can be there to sort of augment the workforce. So they can help to um, help with understanding cultural differences and ha understand how patients interact with the health system. So I think the creativity that needs to, to come out that we've already seen come out includes really maybe connecting more, finding ways to connect more people to um, peer navigators and to those um, organizations like TROSA who are doing the work um, and, you know, maintain the good work that they're doing or maintain people in community that don't have access to um, sort of 24-hour care. And so I think that, you know, what they're doing as far as maintaining the relationship is, is key. I think in this virtual environment that we're working in, it's much harder to establish new relationships than it is to continue existing relationships. And so I think on both sides, um, an effort needs to be, you know, we have to put out a real effort to maintain those relationships while also keeping an eye on once this pandemic passes, which it will, um, to start building those relationships with those partners that maybe we hadn't had strong relationships with that we have seen do service in the community. So my guess is what the phrase many people will remember from this virtual town hall is once the pandemic passes, which it will, because so many people yeah. are asking, will this ever end? It will. Let me go to you, Blake. Um, Marcel in Cabarrus County is asking about syringe exchange programs and how we can ensure participants still receive those necessary services and resources during COVID-19. Thoughts? Yeah, um, so I think there's a lot of syringe services in our uh, communities in North Carolina. It would be, always be great if there were more, but they really have worked hard to adapt. So as a, for instance, um, one of the syringe services that is in my area has um, d developed a, uh, a mobile van and you go to their website and it says where, what, which addresses they'll be at, and then they are able to um, give the syringe, syringes to the people that need it along with other services like uh, naloxone and other things in a, uh, a six-foot and um, appropriate manner with people wearing masks and such. So that's great that, that they're able to do that. So I would suggest to folks that if, if you have a syringe service uh, in your area, if you will go and Google the, the ones that I've Googled, it, they talk about COVID and how they're best uh, um, um, setting up so that they can continue to, to help their clients. Wonderful. And 
Keith, let me give you this question, um, which comes up every time we talk about substance use disorders. It's a question of stigma. So Emily in Morganton wants to know, how do we work to overcome the stigma that keeps people from seeking treatment? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, stigma is certainly a major barrier for folks seeking seeking treatment. And, you know, we try, at Trisa, we try to do a lot of, um, as an organization down to the individuals, we, we try to be an active, engaged member in a community, in the, in the Durham community and the, and the Triangle community. Um, you know, that's not, technically our mission is not to change people's perceptions of people in recovery, but... Um, but in a lot of ways, that's just sort of the way we act is is something that um, I think helps do that and also instills in the folks uh, in our program a sense of confidence that, that they can be a, a valued member of the community. You know, we um, you know, that's been one of the hard things is, you know, we I, I mentioned that we've had to suspend a lot of our community service activities. I mean, these are things that uh, that really mean a lot to uh, folks at TROSA um, and it. it it, and to, to not be able to do that is hard and trying to find ways uh, in the pandemic that we can um, still do those things uh, has been really important. You know, we've been, uh, uh, for example, we, we, made, we made cloth masks for everyone at Trosa has uh, a, a number of cloth masks. And uh, we started, uh, once we kind of had our community covered, we started, we realized we should start making some for our neighbors and for some first responders and others who uh, didn't have access at the time. And, and that's been like a project that a lot of people have taken on nice. uh, around TROSA. Very so. nice. Thank you. Thanks. You know, many people diagnosed with a substance use disorder also suffer from other mental health or behavioral disorders. NC Impact caught up with a Granville County man who overcame his addiction and turned things around to help others. After my playing days, I left the gym and I got hurt my back. I don't actually know how I hurt my back, and I got prescribed opiates. Um, and uh, it did something to me that I can't explain. I was physically addicted to the opiates. I've been diagnosed as bipolar. Most people who are, again, who has a mental illness, uh, three-fourths of those people have a substance use problem. And I'm one of those people. Prior to getting clean, I, I was um, incarcerated at Pitt County Detention Center. Uh, for five months. After my five months there, um, they asked me what I wanted to do, and I told them I wanted to go to a long-term treatment program. Went to a two-year program in Durham, uh, Trosa in Durham, uh, where uh, I found my, my purpose, and that's helping other people like myself. The, the Stepping Up Initiative was started by the National Association of Counties and also NAMI in 2015, and it gives us opportunities for counties to find ways to alleviate um, people with mental health issues and substance use issues that are nonviolent offenders, to try to keep them out of our jails and find them proper treatment. What we've learned from our jail administrators in this five county region is that they see a lot of the same people over and again. And a lot of the same people that they see in our local jails are not necessarily hardened criminals. They might need to have um, health care attention and that would better serve both them individually in the community. Going on six years of uh, sobriety, I made a decision and I act on the decision. And I had, if I hadn't have done it, um, I don't think I'd be alive today. I really don't. I get up every morning and I go to bed every night with gratitude. If you can save one life, we've done a lot. Dana, individuals with a substance use disorder are more likely to experience incarceration than those in the general population. How are the unique challenges of incarceration and substance use disorder complicated by COVID-19? You know, I think that um, they're severely complicated for a variety of reasons. I mean, first and foremost, our um, correctional institutions have become the default uh, mental health providers for many communities throughout the state and throughout the country. And jails really aren't, jails and prisons really aren't the right environment to provide care for people who need, who have uh, mental health or substance abuse disorders. Um, and so I think primarily we've 
we've defaulted to the wrong system to support people um, who need care. And then secondarily, I think the challenge is that jails specifically and prisons are not equipped to um, take on all of the measures that we know can help to prevent and mitigate the spread of um, this virus. And so those facilities are presented with a variety of challenges um, in order to, you know, because what we know is that um, social isolation is virtually impossible because most facilities tend to experience some level of overcrowding. Um, we know that they have very little access to personal protective equipment and um, materials to sanitize their environments. Um, and they also have differential access to local hospitals and treatment for those who are seriously ill. So there are a variety of policy actions that I think that we can take to help mitigate the spread um, in jails and prisons and also divert people who really shouldn't be going to jails and prisons in the first place to facilities or treatment programs that can help provide the care that they need. So let me just stick with this issue of discharge um, for a moment. I want to turn to you, Keith, to ask you this question that has come in from Philip in Asheville, which is how has COVID-19 impacted the discharge plans at treatment centers like TROSA? Well, you know, one of the one of the biggest complications for us at TROSA is the, the last stage of our program, the last three months are what we uh, we call workout is uh, folks finding employment in the community and uh, and basically they continue to receive the support of Trosa in terms of housing and meals and transportation but they're they're employed outside of Trosa in the community and obviously during this uh, time of crisis uh, you know job searching is not something that's really easy to do or in many cases even possible to do most of all of the employers who have traditionally worked with us are either not hiring and, and in worst cases uh, doing furloughs or laying people off. So we've had to prepare for people to um, uh, you know, do searches remotely and also extend their stay at Trosa if they need to. We're not, we're not looking at telling people, you know, look, you've hit your, your 24 months at Trosa and you know, we don't, if you don't have a job, we're still willing to continue to let people stay uh, at our program and uh, continue their search for employment if that's what's necessary. Uh, in addition for our graduates, um, uh, many of our graduates go into uh, supportive housing that we, we provide uh, post-graduation. And um, we've been working with um, uh, uh, fee relief for all the folks who are in, uh, in our graduate programs uh, just because of, of the trying times to make sure that people don't get put in a position where they, they might uh, uh, end up in, in a bad a bad spot that might lead them back towards uh, substance use issues. Got it. Thank you. We're getting a number of questions in around special populations. Blake, you know from the area of the state in which you work that transportation can often be a huge barrier for people seeking um, health services, no matter what they might be. So Rustland Cabarrus County wants to know, how do you see the future of telehealth in the management of substance use disorder in pregnant patients seeking prenatal care? Yeah, um, and we are doing that now. Uh, so I'm a family physician that actually sees pregnant women as well for prenatal care and delivery. And then we have within our organization uh, um, an OBGYN residency as well. So they are seeing folks and they're seeing them by telehealth. And there's certain things that you actually can do by telehealth, um, but there's certain visits that you just have to see the patient. Um, and so we continue to struggle with that uh, transportation issue on the times that we do need to get them in for care. But you could imagine that we're starting to set up systems like, oh, your next visit, um, if everything's going well, we're going to try to set that up to be telehealth to reduce your chance of getting uh, into the community and potentially getting COVID. Um, but also the patients are um, actually grateful that, uh, you know, even though gas is cheap, it's still three bucks, or I have to ask uh, somebody that's not within my 
family unit, which means I'm going outside my germ pool or whatever words you want to put to that to ask somebody to drive me in. And even though we're both wearing cloth masks, I'm coming in for 45 minutes. Um, and if I can um, reduce the number of those type of activities by doing telehealth for the, my next visit, then they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm for this. So Wonderful. Keith, Blake, Dana, I can't thank you enough for being with us today and sharing such great insights into a situation that was troubling before COVID-19, but has gotten so much more complicated as a result of. This has been very, very helpful. Thank you for watching and engaging. When we work together, we find new solutions always, even in the face of COVID-19. If you think of a solution or have a comment, visit unctv.org slash ncimpact. Coming up on NC Impact. The children under five may be the smallest percentage, but they're 100% of our future. Children can be at risk as caregivers deal with stress during COVID-19. We'll look at how communities are ensuring children's well-being during the crisis. NC Impact is made possible by funding from Civic Federal Credit Union and is a public media North Carolina production in association with the University of North Carolina School of Government.